Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1,821. Today I'm back across the pond with a very special guest in the UK. We'll have some fun. Be prepared to be inspired. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah. Today I'm in Presbury in the UK with a very special guest by the name of Richard Charlesworth. Richard, welcome to Cars Yeah. Do you have it in gear, and are you ready to release the clutch? Mark, I'm ready to go. All right. I assume a guy like you is always ready to go in a fine automobile. Now, before I give you a proper introduction, Richard, what's maybe one little thing that most people don't know about you? What people don't know about me? Maybe people don't know that um, I have had the good fortune to drive the most valuable Rolls Royce in the world, AX201, the Silver Ghost, the one and only true Silver Ghost, Wow! on a pub crawl in Edinburgh. A pub crawl. Okay. Now, there's a great, an interesting combination. Let's go on a pub crawl and drive the most valuable Rolls Royce in the world. What was the situation in which you got to do that? I can't even imagine. Well, it's a slight exaggeration, but uh, this is when uh, I worked for the company that was Rolls Royce and Bentley. But we had restored this famous car, the Silver Ghost, spent two years restoring it meticulously. Um, and we did a, a drive from John O'Groats to Land's End, that's the top of the UK to the bottom, uh, in this car, raising money for um, a children's charity in the UK. And we had various groups of journalists following us on different legs of the journey. And when we were in Edinburgh, I happened to have uh, three or four wonderful Japanese journalists with me. And they we were driving through Edinburgh and they said, could we go to the pub? And I said, <laughs> yeah, why not? Let's go to the pub. So we, we went to the pub. We visited a, a nice pub in the Hay, uh, Haymarket area, I think it was, of Edinburgh. And so to have the most famous, most valuable Rolls Royce in the world parked outside the pub in Edinburgh was an experience I'll, I made me smile at the time and I've never forgotten it. So, But I didn't I didn't tell everybody because I'm sure there'd be those who would have frowned upon us at the time, but um, <laughs> there you go. Well, I've had the luxury of driving some pretty nice cars and one of the things that, that people have asked me, uh, and it goes back to, I'll tell you, the first Rolls Royce I drove was when I was in my first year of high school. I was 16. I had a car detailing business and a woman had bought the first Rolls Royce Royce Corniche, the convertibles that came out in the 70s. Yeah, yeah. And she, I went, rode my bike to her home to pick it up and I drove it back to my house and I pulled up in front of our house and my mother came out and she about passed out. She said, this car costs more than our house. And uh, <laughs> she goes, you can't drive this. You can't drive this. And I go, mom, don't worry. It's all cool. I never worried too much driving cars that had great value because I'm a very careful person. I just enjoyed the experience. You've driven so many. When you think about that one special car, was there any bits about you that kind of went, boy, better be careful with this thing? Oh, yeah, of course. And and you, you were very careful with it because not just because of its value, but because of its its uh, importance in automotive history. But but I've had the good fortune being, uh, as I say, formerly at Rolls-Royce and Bentley and then latterly at Bentley to drive lots of very valuable motor cars. And if you worried about it all the time, you'd freeze. And so I, I never forget the importance of the car and its value, but I try not to let it uh, stop my enjoyment of driving it. Yep. The key word is respect there, I believe. At least that's what I put in the back of my head when I sit behind the wheel. Well, let me give you a proper introduction. We're going to dive into this incredible life you've created around fine motor cars. Richard Charlesworth had a long career with Rolls-Royce and Bentley motor cars, going all the way back to 1974, where his role took him all over the world in a wide variety of positions. Among his many ventures, he was appointed MVO, which is member of the Royal Victorian Order by the Queen, yes, the Queen, in her Golden Jubilee Honors List for services to Her Majesty. From 2007 until he retired, he was the Director of Royal and VIP Relations and Head of the Bentley Heritage Collection, and the company expert on Bentley history. Since fully retiring in 2017, Richard is now chairman of the steering committee and co-presenter for the Concours of Elegance in Hampton Court Palace and co-presenter of the London Concours. And he also acts as master of ceremonies at the Quail, 
a motorsports gathering since 2004. I've seen you up there on the stage many, many times. We'll be back in just a minute to talk with Richard, but first a word from our very valued sponsors that make this show possible. Keep your seatbelts on. We'll be right back. The best way to protect and preserve your vehicles, along with the meanings and memories and experience that they give you, is with a quality-made, custom-fit car cover from my friends at Covercraft. I purchased my first Covercraft cover for my 1967 Gia way back when I was in high school in 1975. At Covercraft.com, you'll find a multitude of indoor options, including form fit, fleece satin, and their very unique view shield. That's right. You can see your car right through the cover. But it's the sun that you really need to worry about. Quality outdoor options include Weather Shield HD and HP, Sunbrella, Reflect, Carhartt, Evolution, and NOAA. Covercraft protects cars, trucks, motorcycles, RVs, trailers, and watercraft too. Your cover is custom tailored for your special vehicles and manufactured with the quality and attention to detail that's been their standard since 1965. And I've got a great deal for you. If you use the code YA21 at Covercraft.com, they'll give you 10% off compliments of cars. Yeah, that's right. 10% off. Simply use the code YEAH21, Y-E-A-H-21, at checkout. Covercraft, protecting the things that move you. Last year, I changed my collector car coverage to American Collectors Insurance. That's who now protects my Porsche Turbo, the one I call my Orange Crush. But did you know they also insure your valuable collections of automobilia and other collectibles If you're like me, you've invested in a lot of cool collectibles over the years. Those items are valuable. And if you were to lose them in a theft or a fire, well, try to get your normal homeowner's insurance to pay you what they're worth. Good luck with that. American Collectors Insurance provides you with assurance and confidence that your collectibles are fully covered. They insure a lot of items, including automobilia, wine, baseball cards, books, figurines, die-cast models, model trains, glassware, sports memorabilia, toys, and a whole lot more. American Collectors Insurance, they've been protecting us enthusiasts since 1976. They provide you with an agreed value insurance policy backed by a long history of taking care of their clients. Give them a call today for your personal agreed value quote at 866-ACA. Yeah, yeah. That's 866-224-9324. Tell them you're a friend of mine, Mark Rains here at Cars. Yeah, American Collectors Insurance. Classic car insurance designed by collectors for collectors. Automotive enthusiasts just like you and me. That's American Collectors Insurance. All right, Richard, we are back. So let's go a little deeper into the corner, have a little bit of fun here in these fine cars that you've got to spend your life with. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about your history and your involvement with Bentley and Rolls-Royce. What a what a career you've had. And then kind of mold that into uh, this Concours, the Concours of Elegance and your involvement with them. Well, I think one led to the other. I, having worked, as you've described, with Rolls-Royce and then Natalie Bentley all my working life, um, when the Concourse of Elegance started, um, the first year was 2012 at Windsor Castle. So as you can imagine, it's a, a wonderful place to be able to hold a concourse. And that what that's something that makes the concourse unique is that we, we have access to royal palaces by permission of Her Majesty the Queen to hold the concourse. Because as we'll talk later, we do raise money for charities that are close to the hearts of, of the Queen and the royal family. But because I was the person to go to at, uh, at Bentley, to get involved with a concourse like that. I was the Bentley representative and then got to know the concourse well as it developed over the years, moving around different royal palaces in the UK. Uh, Until when I retired, it became a natural step to start working with them to keep myself involved and for the good fun of it, and because it's a great concourse to be part of. And so I was helping with the curation of cars for a couple of years until uh, I was asked to become chairman of the steering committee uh, this year. So it's uh, I worked closely with them um, uh, as, a, as a Bentley representative, if you like, and then, then became to work clo- more closely with them now as chairman of the steering committee. Let's talk a little bit about this charity. One of the great things about all the great concours around the world is they raise an enormous amount of money for charities. And it's fantastic the things that they do. I mean, even last year when COVID shut everything down, take the Pebble Beach Concours, they still raised an enormous amount of money for the local charities there in the Monterey Peninsula. So talk a little bit about the charity that's involved with the Concours of Elegance. 
Well, we, we part of the the uh, relationship we have, as I say, being being close to the royal household and to the royal family, is that there's a sort of a, an understanding that we get this unique access to royal palaces where we can take a very lucky and very important entrance with their fine motor cars and our guests. But we then uh, make sure that the charitable contributions we make go to charities that are nominated by the Queen herself or by the royal household. And, you know, we're coming up to our 10th anniversary next year. and We have so far raised over one and a half million pounds, which have gone to charities that are nominated by the Queen or by the Royal Household. And they, not always, but they tend to quite often be, as you can imagine, knowing the Royal Family's connection with the armed services, they go to uh, to benefit um, people who have served in the armed forces and been wounded or damaged by that service. So walking with the wounded is one, but also they help a variety of other charities uh, that are nominated by the royal family such as you know tackling addiction uh, helping vulnerable young people so there's a whole range of things that we've been fortunate enough to be able to assist it's absolutely spectacular and speaking of spectacular the hampton court palace oh my gosh it's it's a backdrop a setting that is out of this world it's a place where tourists can go and visit but to be able to visit it being surrounded by some of the most special motor cars in the world, can't even imagine. Uh, what are some of the, the types of vehicles we're going to be seeing at this event? And when is the event this year? A few questions there, Mark. Yeah, back to the palace. I mean, it is an astonishing palace. I mean, you never get planning permission for it nowadays because it's effectively two palaces from two entirely different eras in our history stuck together. So you, when you approach it from the front entrance, it is a Tudor palace built by and for Henry VIII. But then when you walk through, suddenly you come into then a 200-year younger palace built by William Orange when he be, was invited to come and be king. So it's a William and Mary building on the other side. <laughs> but as you say, the concourse is in the palace gardens, which are incredibly uniquely manicured gardens. And uh, we are the only commercial event you can come to that happens in the palace. But the layout is perfect. And we pride ourselves on never having cars twice, uh, or certainly not in not within 10 years. So from next year, we'll start to look at some of the cars that we had 10 years previously to bring back as special guests. But you get cars from all over the world and of all eras, you know, right from the earliest up to, in terms of the concourse itself, to cars from the sort of 70s, probably. But then we also have something called Future Classics, where we look at current production supercars that will be invited to concourse in 50, 60 years' time. But of those 60 cars in the main concourse, it's it's the sort of cars you'd expect to see from different eras, from you know whether it's early Rolls-Royce or Bentley through the beautiful Art Deco period, the French coach builders of uh, pre-World War II, the wonderful Ferrari Berlinettas from uh, the post-war period. Um, so we try and make sure that we have a selection that, that cover the world, both in terms of different marks and different geography. And you know we're fortunate there are some great owners of great collections out there who love to share their cars with uh, with their peers and with with others who are enthusiastic and so we you know we we always get a great turnout of owners each year and, and this year will be just as good as any other year if not better and to answer your question about dates it's the third to the fifth of September uh, this year and uh, you know we're all keeping our fingers crossed that everything will continue to gradually unlock so we can run again we ran last year because we were between lockdowns last year mm, yes and we had to obviously work within covid restrictions but we were able to do that because we're in a huge open garden so it was something that was fairly um, straightforward to do so and we did it very successfully so yeah we're looking forward to having a good display of cars again with the the 60 car list is almost full already because people are keen to get back out there but you know we're still making sure that we keep our eyes open for anything that is particularly special so we can fill one of those last slots uh, with something that people will love to see no doubt people are biting at the bit to get out and travel and be around automobiles and cars again it's just this pent-up angst that is happening around the world uh is just relentless so cannot wait for this event now will you also still be involved with the quail this year i will yes i mean uh, as we've said uh we're all hoping that uh, things will continue to improve you know the us and the uk are leading the way in terms of getting vaccination out to mm -hmm. first the most vulnerable and then to the wider population so Hopefully, if everything goes well, we will have Car Week again in Monterey Carmel. So, yeah, I will be there at the Quail doing my bit to keep our, uh, our fortunate visitors and entrants um, entertained. Another incredible event I love to attend. Let's go back a little bit into your career. It's evolved around 
the finest motor cars uh, that exist. Uh, when did you realize that that was the path you wanted to take with your life? When my original chosen path failed me, I was going to be an airline pilot. Ah. And then I, I, I managed to, I was one of uh, 50 out of 100, sorry, out of 1,200 applicants who passed the aptitude tests. Uh, but then I failed the medical. They detected a heart problem that turned out not to be a problem at all. But anyway, oh, gosh. by then it was too late. So I happened to be in London at the time, uh, wondering what to do. Now my life had fallen around me and I saw a, a, a poster advertising the, the Earl's Court Motor Show. So I uh, went to have a look and I, like many people, walked past the Rolls-Royce and Bentley stand and stared in wonder at these motor cars. But then I realised something I'd not really thought much about, and that was that I was brought up on a farm that was a little over a mile away from the factory at Crewe in Cheshire, where the cars were built. So I went and knocked on the door and asked for a job, and luckily they said yes. And so I started working there and, and did so until I retired. Incredible. Well, it's turning uh, the proverbial lemons into lemonade, if you will, uh -huh. and then finding something that you're passionate about. And obviously, you're very passionate about cars. When you look back on your career now, do you do you sit a little bit in awe and say, wow, how did I get so fortunate to be able to, because I know you're passionate about automobiles, to get to have a whole life wrapped up into this? I do. I, and I don't think I ever stopped realizing how fortunate I was. And, and as we'll probably cover later, you know, sometimes, you know, your trajectory goes down rather than up. But, um, you know, you always, uh, anybody working for a company like that cannot fail to be touched by the the importance of and the beauty of the products that they, they represent. And uh, I think as much as anything, it's the human side of it. It's uh, it's a very personal business working in, in uh, Rolls-Royce or Bentley. You know, Bentley today is still, you know, 4,000 wonderful people who, who craft beautiful motor cars for equally lovely people. And so it is the personal side of it, dealing with the craftsmen and women who get to develop and build these things and with the great people who buy them. Not to mention the incredible history behind Rolls-Royce and Bentley. What a life that you've had. I'd love to have you talk a bit about driving inspirations, people or maybe a key mentor or two in your life that really helped you move along, be successful, very influential people or persons. Who would that be? Well, having given this some thought, there's three names I wrote down to remind myself. I think when I was an early part of my career, I went to uh, work in the Middle East for a few years, and I'll come back to that. But we had a change at the top, and we had a guy called Peter Ward who came in as chairman and CEO of what was then Rolls-Royce and Bentley. And he brought a, a younger, fresher um, energy to the company, and I related to him a lot, and he was a great guide to me uh, and oversaw me progressing quite um, rapidly in my career. He was quite an inspirational leader and somebody who I looked up to considerably at the time. And it was how to, he showed well how to take a very uh, traditional pair of brands in Bentley and Rolls-Royce and how to bring them or the way they do business up to date. So he didn't try and change the wonderful character of the products, but obviously that evolved with technology, but he made it a more uh, a younger, more energetic business. And I really reacted very well to that. So Peter Ward, as a former boss, I would hold up as one of those. There was another chap called Ian Mackay, who um, was the marketing director and who I worked for for a couple of years. And what I liked about him was that he was quite an unusual character in that he had the creativity, but also the organizational ability to see things through. Because I'm sure you've seen the same thing, Mark, where some people are great at having ideas, but wouldn't have the foggiest idea how to implement them. Mm -hmm. There are those that are not very creative, but good at doing things. Well, he was good at both. He could have the ideas, but also he knew how to implement them. And so I, I learned a lot from him. But the third name I wanted to mention is a name you will recognize as well, just because he's a great individual for showing how you can be at the top of your game, but still very humble and accessible. And that's Derek Bell. Oh, yes. Uh, Derek, I've got to know very well over many years, and, and I'm fortunate to count him as a friend. He and Misty and Zoe and I know each other quite well. And there's somebody who is as, as good as you can get in his business, yet has always been very accessible, very modest, very unassuming in the way he deals with people, whether they know anything about motor racing or not. And so I've always taken from him that, you know, however good or successful or whatever you, you important you are in your role, never, never let it go to your head. Always be humble about it, always be accessible and always recognize that, it, you know, you are only as good as other people who support you. Absolutely. I've had the uh, honor of having Derek, a uh, guest here on Cars, yeah, and his son, and also uh, got to spend some time with him several times uh, around cars at different car events when he was visiting the Pacific Northwest, or we were uh, happened to be at the uh, Monterey Historic races together when he was racing and 
The sun was racing there. So yeah, Derek is fantastic. There's nothing like having a great people around you. That is a key to success, surrounding ourselves with uh, great people for sure. If you were to advise a young person these days who wants to embark on a career in the automotive world, what's maybe one way you would advise them? I think, uh, as you know, nowadays, the, you, you can't do what I did, uh, really. You can't go knock on the door and say, can I have a chat with somebody, please? Yep. Nowadays, it's much more sophisticated. And of course, you've got to have the right qualifications to get in. You know, it, it is very much what you know rather than who you know. A bit of who you know doesn't hurt uh, even these days. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, I think if, if you have a particular passion for a particular product uh, or service, then never give up on your dream. You know, I think that um, you, there's always a way in. There's always people you can talk to. There's always people you can find who can help you gain the right qualifications or have the right conversations that enables you to be part of something you want to be part of. So I think it's determination and ambition. Never give in. That's right. Never, the great words of Sir Winston Churchill, never, ever, never, ever give up. Uh, that's for sure. If there's something you want to do, we're going to take a short break. We come back. I've got a bit of a challenge question for you. So keep the seatbelts on. We'll be right back. Okay. What began as a charitable car show has grown into the world's greatest collector car auctions raising over $133 million for charitable organizations to date. For nearly 50 years, automotive enthusiasts from all over the world have enjoyed the Barrett-Jackson Collector Car Auctions, and I'm a huge fan. Regarded as the barometer of the collector car industry, their auctions are world-class lifestyle events, where thousands of the world's most sought-after unique and valuable automobiles cross the block in front of a global audience, in person, on TV, or streamed online. Barrett Jackson produces the world's greatest collector car auctions in Scottsdale, Arizona, Palm Beach, Florida, Las Vegas, Nevada, and new for 2021, Houston, Texas. The excitement of Barrett Jackson auctions is contagious, and a unique experience is not to be missed. And coming soon, something new for you Cars Yeah listeners, I'll be teaming up with Craig Jackson on the first ever Barrett Jackson podcast, coming to your mobile devices every week. Listen here on Cars Yeah and check out the Barrett Jackson website for unique details on this new exciting podcast that I'm very proud to be a part of. And be sure to visit BarrettJackson.com today. Barrett Jackson, the world's greatest collector car auctions. All right, Richard, uh, let's talk about a big obstacle that you faced in your career, something you've had to overcome or could be in your life. But more importantly, this question is all about how that experience helped you gain even more momentum as you learn from it and move forward. I think uh, I mentioned earlier that, you know, when you, I think in anybody's career, um, there's very few people who progress upwards and onwards in a in a single trajectory and never have setbacks and like everybody else I've had occasions where I've been promoted downwards and um, I remember one such occasion I'd, I'd enjoyed a pretty uh, rapid climb through the ranks from being an area manager for Rolls-Royce and Bentley in the UK I went, went out to the Middle East for a few years and I was the general manager for the company out there and of course that was fantastic uh, running your own office living in the Middle East and you were your own boss I only had a couple of people working for me, which was fine, and we got on very well, good friends, and I largely was responsible for what I did for a few years. Then when I then came back and I said to the chairman at the time, Peter Ward, well, you know, it's my time to come back. What can I do? And he said, well, I've got a role for you that you might not enjoy too much, but it'll be good for you, so trust me. And I came back into the factory, and um, we were at the time about to implement, implement a new um, uh, software-based uh, manufacturing process to, you know, as part of the bringing the, this this ancient his, ancient company up to date. And he put me in the in the project team that was uh, incorporating this new manufacturing uh, system called MRP2. That'll ring a bell to somebody. Uh, manufacturing Resource Planning, it stood for. And so I was part of a team of mainly engineers and manufacturing people sitting in the big open plan office talking to people about software-based uh, manufacturing processes, so all about inventory planning and production management and what have you, which was something that I had not had any knowledge about and not a huge interest in either, I have to say. So I had to eat humble pie a bit and stop being this important bloke who swanned around the world uh, managing the, the, the company's business in the Middle East um, and beyond and be part of a team walking around the factory with clipboards talking to people about new processes. Wow. Well, when you think about that, step back, if you will, and you see it now from the perspective, what did it teach you? 
Well, it, it did a lot of good for me. It taught me that, you know, you have to uh, take the rough with the smooth. It enabled me to deal with people and meet with people I wouldn't otherwise have uh, got to know. Uh, it built a closer relationship with the people who made the factory tick, who built the cars, who worked out the manufacturing processes and, uh, and the logistics of the company. So as I then progressed in my career with the company, it meant that I knew a much broader base of people and that I could go to people for help, support. If ever I had a problem, I knew who I could go to and get that problem resolved. And that was something that I came to appreciate many times over the latter half of my career and, and also taught me humility you know you're never too important to take on a change and to uh, um, you know take a step back now and then and you know it wasn't the only downwards promotion I had in my life but it taught me that you know you have to you know take the rough with the smooth and adapt to the, the situation that faces you. Uh, it's a great story you shared with us and no doubt somebody out there listening is facing the same thing keep the chin up as they say there will be things to learn from this experience that you can carry oh, sure. forward in a positive way. Thanks for sharing that with us. Now, you're a guy that I don't think retirement is really uh, part of your plan. I mean, you just keep getting involved, doing things around this world of cars, uh, you know, so-called retirement in 2017, but that has not slowed you down one little bit. I can't see you sitting on a porch in a rocking chair. What's uh, maybe another big bucket list item you'd like to accomplish in your life looking forward? Well, Mark, you say that. I mean, I, and I've I've travelled a lot with with the company, with my business, and I have a huge, a huge um, uh, memories, fond memories of travelling around the world. But most of the time, when I've done that, it's been you know for a specific purpose of of working, and uh, therefore you're going to see people and have meetings, and you're not getting much time to look around. And yep. obviously, as a family man, that you know, once the job's done, you want to get home, so you don't take time out to go and look around places. So. I have had the opportunity to travel quite a bit with my wife and my kids, and that's something that my bucket list is to do more of that. I have a, a dream of getting one of those big, impossible RVs that you have in North America. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, and I want to spend time traveling around the USA. I think there's, there's a lot that I've seen, but there's so much that I still want to see. And you're so lucky that you have such a big country and so many different aspects and wonderful parts of it. I want to be able to cruise around in my RV with my family and friends and just see more of America. So that's that's definitely on my bucket list. So traveling in my own time, I guess, is what I want to do more of. You know, this is a huge thing happening right now. In fact, here in the United States, if you try to go buy a travel trailer or a motorhome, they're all gone. Everybody, not everybody, but people of a certain age group, and I think even younger people that can work remotely are realizing there's a whole different world here that I can explore. And you're right. In the United States, there is so much here and it's so diverse. There's so many different things to see. I have a lot of friends that are in my age bracket right now that have gone out and bought either these modified sprinter van campers or incredible trailers. A good friend of mine just bought a trailer called a Bolus. If you've never seen that, look it up. It is insane. Well. It's super cool. Uh, and people are realizing it's time to get out. And what you just said, especially after coming off this pandemic, spending time with family and friends has become more important than I think ever in our lives because we've been realized, you know what, uh, this is a cherished time. You got to spend time with family and friends. So we welcome you to come over here, Richard, and uh, travel the country. There's a lot to see. Well, there is. I am. And I'm really looking forward to doing that. You know, I, I, We've all spent more time with our families than we imagine we would with lockdown, of course. Yeah. Um, and, and I have to say that I was very fortunate, you know, that I was I was happy to do that. I've got nice walking country around here, but but it hasn't put me off traveling with my family. You'll be pleased to know. Yeah, well, there's a lot to see. So come on over, as they say. Uh, tell me about a really special <laughs> vehicle in your life. Now, this must be a very hard question to answer because you've had so many very special vehicles you've been around. You shared that story with the ghost, but is there maybe one that we can talk about today that really stands out for you, a great memory with a special vehicle? What was that? Well, it, it, there is, Mark, and it's an easy one for me because the most wonderful motor car I've ever had the pleasure of driving, and I drove it quite a bit, is a 1930 Bentley Speed 6 um, called All Number 2. Now, uh, Bentley only ever built two cars just to race, and that was uh, two Speed Sixes built for the 1930 race season called, uh, latterly, Old Number One and Old Number Two. Now, Old Number One is a most wonderful car as well. It lives in the northwest of the USA. It's the it's the car that won Le Mans in 1929 and 1930, 
um, and then went on to be a, a Brooklyn's racer as well. <clears throat> and that's a special car. But but old number two is the car that uh, came second in the 1930 Le Mans 24 hour uh, and is still in exactly the condition it was in when it raced. It was restored very sensitively um, around, uh, what, now nearly 20 years ago now, not far off, by the then owner. Uh, it now lives in North America as well. Um, but that is a car that I drove. Um, it, it was at Pebble Beach uh, in 2009 uh, mm -hmm. for the Brooklands class, which was celebrating the centenary of Brooklands. And the owner of the car at the time um, said to me, I'd love you to look after the car because I've been involved with him in, in uh, overseeing its restoration in the UK. And I drove it. I broke, drove it onto the field early in the morning saying hello to Barry Maguire as I drove in. And then I, uh, then I drove it from there up to... Um, an event that was taking place uh, um, in Northern California over the Golden Gate. So I drove it up from Monterey over the Golden Gate Bridge. Wow. Uh, I mean, gone up the coastal highway. And that was one of the most special journeys I've ever had in this most iconic motor car. And I got to drive it quite a bit subsequently. And that, to me, is the most enjoyable drive I've ever had. It's the most special motor car I've ever driven. Uh, and I just, I will never forget that. Uh, yes, I saw you drive that car onto the lawn. You had a huge smile on your face that morning, <laughs> as early as it was. But I can't imagine going on to get to spend so much time with that vehicle. What a spectacular car. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's... that's... It, was, it is, and it, it remains, you know, I think it's one of the most special cars I've ever driven. It, it is one of the most important, but there's lots of great Bentleys. Um, I could rattle off, you know, several that, that are up there with it. But but just the drive of that, it's such a good car to drive. You know, some cars are easy and others to drive. And uh, Bentley gearboxes are something that, you know, you can either handle them or you can't. Well, luckily, I, I'm not too bad at it. And that was the sweetest car I've ever driven. But such a huge privilege to drive it as well. Oh, my gosh. Old number two. Well, that's when being number two is just as good as being number one. So that's, <laughs> that's pretty good. Now, I'm going to crawl into your head a little bit here with a little bit of a psychiatry analysis. If you were manifest as a vehicle, Richard, this isn't what you want to be. This is your personality, who you are as a person manifest into a vehicle. What would you be? And more importantly, why? Well, it, it, this is going to sound like a cop out, Mark, because one of the reasons that I enjoyed the roles that I had at Bentley and, um, and, and fitted quite well into that role um, was because I think that the car reflected my personality and I reflected it. So, you know, um, my, my, my kids say to me that, you know, I, I'm, I'm very fashionable about once every 12 years because <laughs> I don't change what I wear and, or how I look. And so that's fashionable about once every 12 years, apparently. <laughs> and I think the great thing about these Bentleys is that they are, they're big, boisterous machines. And I'm quite a big bloke. Um, they are, very British. Uh, they're quite traditional, but they are uh, formidable vehicles. They um, have strength in depth. They have, you know, they're not uh, too um, overclaiming or boastful. They just do the job and do it very well. And I kind of would love to feel that that's the way that I would be seen as well, is that, you know, I hope I'm not too over the top. I hope I'm not too pushy, but I hope I'm seen by those that know me as being uh, reliable and um, a good, solid uh, friend and supporter when needed and that's what an old bentley is you know i think you answered that question quite well i'll tell our listeners today i had the honor of meeting richard about well just over 10 years ago at retromobile in france and one of the things that i i believe i may have said was I see you every year at these car events. Who are you? <laughs> and yeah. and it's the fact that you do stand out. You're a tall gentleman and you're very distinguished and you have this look and that mustache. And so uh, er all these years of going to Pebble and car shows and Quail and seeing you and then getting to meet you and now getting to talk to you and get to know you better. I think the Bentley fits your personality quite well. So. Well, thank you. Very, very well done. Too outrageous a, a suggestion. Not at all. Not at all. Now, I've learned after talking with 1,820 people here on Cars, yeah, that successful people, one of the reasons for their success is that they give back to others and they help others. It's really the secret sauce to a happy life. What are some of the ways that you like to enjoy to give back to others in the automotive world? Well, I, we've talked about the fact that the Hampton Court Concourse, the, the Concourse of Elegance at Hampton Court Palace is something that I'm uh, heavily involved with. And we are able to um, uh, to raise money for good causes that are nominated by the Royal 
family in the royal household. Uh, but another example is that, again, through the automotive business, um, within the City of London, there is uh, something called um, the City Livery Companies. And uh, livery, the old-fashioned word livery, means effectively what you dress, because if you belong to a particular livery, it, it would it would originate from a particular trade. Um, and so the the City of London used to effectively authorise particular bodies to look after particular trades. Um, and there's about 114 different livery companies in the city. And I, I'm a member of the Coachmakers. It, give it its full title. It's the Worshipful Company of Coachmakers and Coach Harness Makers of London. Oh, wow. We, uh, since, since uh, 1677, we've been authorising people to build coaches and carriages. And if you were well enough off to want to commission a new coach then you would come to the coach makers and we would uh, suggest who you might want to go to and give you a list of those who are authorized by the by the 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 livery to to build coaches now nowadays of course you we're still associated with the industry but in with the automotive and aerospace industries and of course still with coach making because there's still coaches being built that's the one pulled by horses but it's a largely social thing. But the reason that we're part of it is because we have a great time socially, but we raise money for charities. Um, I was the master of the coach makers uh, for the year 2019 to 2020, which was a huge honour and privilege. And so I was able to see firsthand how the money that we raise uh, went towards uh, giving bursaries and apprenticeships to young people, young boys and girls coming into the automotive and aerospace industries. So we would recognise people either from a design point of view or from an engineering point of view who had ambitions to come into the industry but perhaps didn't have the the opportunity or the financial wherewithal to be able to do it. And that's something that we were able to support. So we would allocate many tens of thousands of pounds every year to individuals to help them come into our, our industries. And that's something that gave me a huge amount of pleasure. And of course, to spend to give money to help people but also to spend time with them and members of the livery have mentored people who've come in as well and it, you know to be able to see young people thrive and flourish in the industry that you uh, you love so much and to which has given you a good and enjoyable career it is something that i've taken a huge amount of pleasure from oh it sounds fantastic and when you say the word coach makers i think of the incredible coaches that are part of the royal family and what you see during parades and events and things they're just absolutely incredible have you been able to be around those a little bit and see those up close and personal well i have yeah because part of my role at bentley was to be uh, as you said in the introduction to manage our relationships with the royal family the royal household i was a regular visitor to to buckingham palace and to windsor castle where they have the royal muse as they're called m-e-w-s the royal muse is where the coaches carriages and cars are are kept and maintained and so yeah i've seen the coaches up close and personal and of course that's something that linked in with my being part of the coach makers as well um, is that they have to be maintained so there are people who are still uh, have the skills and knowledge to maintain uh, those coaches and carriages to make sure that they are reliable for the use of the royal family and um, you know including seeing the the state uh, the royal state coach the golden state coach which is only used for coronations um mm. Uh, or the Queen used it for her Golden Jubilee as well. Uh, and that's, you know, an astonishing thing to see, something that's been transporting the kings and queens of, of Great Britain for, you know, for over 300 years is is wow. very special. So, yeah, I've seen them up close, and they are they are ancient vehicles, but they're still in very good working order because they're very well maintained. Ah, wonderful. Is there a book you'd like to share with our listeners today that you found really enjoyable? Well, there you go. There, there, there's one that I, I struggle with. I... I, I'm afraid I'm not. I'm not a very cerebral reader. I, I like light reading. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in fact, when I was travelling around the Middle East, obviously days before uh, mobile phones and laptops and things, you know, I, I spent many hours of every week in airports, and uh, not always the most pleasant experience. But I was able to take my mind away from wherever I was, but just by light reading. So I've read, you know, lots of easy reading novels. Mm -hmm. I like. I like. I like a book where I understand who the goodies are and the baddies are, and I know the goodies are going to win. <laughs> That's my kind of book. And my sort of movie as well, I have to say. So, um, I, I could, no, I'm afraid I couldn't. I couldn't give you one single book. Um, I just like, I enjoy light reading. And unusually for a car guy, I, I don't like reading highly technical automotive books because I'm not an engineer. My, my son is, a, is working as an engineer in the automotive world. But that's not something I'm good at. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I, I like light reading. I like uh, meeting the cars and meeting the people rather than reading about them. So 
I'm really sorry, I can't name a great book that stands out that, that either I have enjoyed particularly or that others would learn from. Well, that's okay. You and I share something, Richard, by my wife, Jill teases me about this she and my son they enjoy these movies that are very heavy and deep and um at the end you're kind of like what and they spur this long thought my wife and my daughter they love horror films and i don't like all those things that that end badly but as she says i like mark likes movies that end with flowers and sausages uh meaning (laughs) it's all happy and grand and the good the good always prevails so i do share that with you (laughs) absolutely well i'll remind our listeners you can go to the cars yeah website There's a uh, under the resources tab, guest recommended books, where there are close to 2,000 books recommended there. I've made it easy for you. So no doubt, Charles, there might be a couple in there you might enjoy as well. So we'll find you one. You can find all these resources on Richard's show notes page. Just go to carsia.com, type in Richard Charlesworth, and it will pop right up. We'll take one more short break. We come back. We're going to go on the ultimate drive with Richard Charlesworth. So sit tight. I've discovered Linkage. It's a new quarterly publication and website that covers the automotive market, driving, restoring, collecting, and discovering your passion for motor vehicles. Linkage is about experiences, opinions, and values. Linkage is an actual, informed, reasoned opinion based on firsthand experiences. A talented Linkage team covers the automotive world, the people who share your passion and mine, Smart, considered, rational, and experienced opinions. Ones you can learn from and grow. That includes our passion that drives auctions and the collector car market. So come with me and join us on this journey. Be sure to use the code Cars yeah when you get your subscription and they'll give you $10 off compliments of Cars yeah. Linkage, geared for the automotive life. Subscribe today at LinkageMag.com. How did you discover your path to a fulfilling life? Too many young people flounder in finding an education and a career that fits. But for those who have a passion for cars, trucks, and motorcycles, and who love working with their hands, problem solving, and fixing things, a career as a professional auto technician is incredibly rewarding. Cars Yeah! is pleased to team up with Tech Force Foundation, our charity of choice in bringing scholarships technical education, and hands-on experience to young people so they can discover a possible future. Join me and lend your support by visiting techforce.org today. All right, Richard, we're going to go on what I like to call the ultimate drive, but you get to pick the vehicle. You get to pick who you're driving or riding with, who's going to be driving or who's going to be riding, and what you're going to be talking about. So who is this special person and What is this special vehicle for you today? Well, I'm going to be very predictable here, Mark. (laughs) And um, you you probably spotted the answer when I gave you an answer to an earlier question. But um, and it's going to sound a bit soppy. But but the person I most want to be with in in any car is my wife, Zoe. Nice. We've enjoyed many journeys. Um, I shared with you a picture of me uh, about to go up the hill at Goodwood, and I'm sitting there in my my Bentley Race overalls, um, and the car I was sitting in that day was um the the probably the most valuable Bentley that exists which is the 1929 Birkin blower team car one of the four racing blowers built and Tim Birkin's personal car it's it's owned by the company I bought it for the company 21 years ago it remains owned by the company I've driven that many times and uh, the photograph was taken when I was about to drive up the hill and Zoe had just sat with me just to drive down to the start of the hill climb so then she had to jump out when I went up the hill but we've enjoyed many journeys um, in different parts of the world I'm fortunate to have a my my uh, classic car collection is a car a collection of one which is a 1929 sorry 1939 speed 25 alvis uh, and she's called Flo because that's her registration number is FLO 196 <laughs> and so so Flo and I have been all over the place and Zoe comes with me but no if I could wave my magic wand the ultimate drive it wouldn't matter what vehicle it was um, if it happened to be Flo that's fine but it could be that RV that I'm going to take around <laughs> yeah. one day and I'd love to with my wife uh, occasionally with my kids or uh, some of my best friends that I still have enjoy having a beer with and um, having known them since I was a teenager. And I talk about just about anything, probably apart from politics and religion. Those are the people I'd like to be with. And as I say, I enjoy driving. And yes, of course, if it's a, a very special, a very important car, then I love 
I love to drive something like that for the for the honour and the privilege of it. But I like driving anything. You know, I'm happy driving um, uh, an old Land Rover or my old Alvis or or anything you like. I just like driving. I love travelling and uh, uh, being in the driver's seat. But my passengers, ideally, uh, would be my wife, my kids, or my best friends. You know, sounds delightful. And uh, for you listeners there, you got to go to Richard's show notes page and see that photograph. There's, It's a marvelous photograph for a couple of reasons. One is you have an enormous smile on your face. You're with your lovely wife. You're in an incredible automobile. But somehow the exposure of that almost looks old-fashioned, but modern. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. So you can check it out on Richard Shonut's page on the Cars Yeah website. Yes, indeed. Sounds absolutely wonderful. Well, you've taken us on a absolutely wonderful ride today, Richard. I'm so grateful to finally be able to reconnect with you, you here and talk about what you're doing with your life. Before I let you go, is there one little parting piece of wisdom or guidance or a success quote or a mantra that you'd like to share with us? I think yeah, what I would say, and this is probably borne out by some of the things I've talked about in terms of my career, I, I would say always be true to yourself. Don't try and pretend to be something you're not. I've seen colleagues in the past who feel they ought to have a particular persona to do a particular job, and that only works for a short time until somebody finds you out. So, you know, we all are ambitious. We all want to do well, but but know your limitations. Be true to yourself and, and always do something you're going to enjoy doing. I mean, occasionally you've got to do stuff that isn't much fun, but if you've got your eye on a goal that means you're going to do something else that you know what you will enjoy, then then do work that you enjoy. Don't let ambition get in your way of enjoy get in the way of enjoyment. Always be true to yourself. Ah, wonderful advice. What are the ways people, listeners today, can learn more about Concord of Elegance at Hampton Court Palace? Well, I'd, we'd love you to go online and just Google it. Just in Google the Concourse of Elegance, Hampton Court Palace. You'll see that we've been to a number of royal palaces. We started at Windsor. We went to St. James's Palace. Hampton Court Palace, uh, we've been to a few times because it works very well. And also to the Palace of Holyrood House, which is the Queen's official residence in Edinburgh in Scotland. Mm. Um, but do visit us there. But better still, if you can get to the UK between the 3rd and 5th of September, come and see us. You can buy tickets online to come and see us. Um, and you will see the most astonishing concourse in the most beautiful surroundings of Hampton Court. And if you do come and see us, come and say hello to me. I'm the bloke talking on the microphone all the time. <laughs> come and say hello. But yeah, look us up. There's some great pictures from the past. And I hope we'll provide a few more great pictures when we have the 2021 event as well. This is uh, one of those events that is a bucket list event. It's something you'll never forget. Take the time to visit Concord of Elegance at Hampton Court Palace because it will be spectacular. You can find everything on Richard Charlesworth's show notes page here on Cars. Yeah, and I'd like to do a shout out to Luke Madden, the director of Influence Associates, for introducing me, uh, reintroducing me to Richard, I should say, since we met so long ago. Richard, yes. thank you for being so generous today with your time, your expertise, and sharing the rich life that you've had. Until you and I talk again, I'll see you at the Concours of Elegance at Hampton Court Palace. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah.